Well, good morning, and welcome to the First Unitarian Church in Salt Lake City. Thank you for joining us in worship on this most unusual day of celebration. Today, I retire from the ministry after 46 years. 34 of those years, the best ones, were right here in this church on 13th East. I'm not quite sure what to make of it when the congregation goes all out to celebrate my departure. Hmm. I, I'd like to put a good spin on it, but, but there's no real certainty, is there? This is somewhat emblematic of ministry overall. I mean, we have work together as a congregation in a, a swirl of uncertainty, uncertain about where our world is headed and what may cross our paths in our own lives. In our efforts seeking clarity and understanding, we have forged a faith, a real deep faith, to see us through whatever storm may come our way. Our faith has led us to uphold human dignity whenever it may be compromised. Our faith has beckoned forth hidden possibilities that sustain our hope. Our faith has enabled us to celebrate, celebrate the triumphs of the human spirit. But now, now is the time for all of us to acknowledge and embrace the transition in the ministry of this community. We can remain confident that our heritage of progressive ideals will always continue strong. This institution has been at it since 1891. Its history is one of providing the wellsprings of light, justice, wisdom, peace to all who thirst. Today is a time to express great pride in the traditions of this church. They rest with you, the people who comprise this justice-seeking congregation, a congregation that cares deeply and tenderly about each other. These are vital components in maintaining our resolve to make this world a better place. So carry on. I know you will. Carry on with style and with love. Symbol of light and of knowledge, symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love.
this church here, I have been entrusted with this little slice of worship. Each week, I have been given the opportunity to write something, read something, share something that I love. Each week comes with its own new set of challenges. And this week has been no different. I've known that this Sunday was coming for a really long time. Each, time, each week would come and I'd say, oh, it's not quite right. I just can't find what I want to say, but it's okay. I have more time to say goodbye. I'll find what I need to say. And here we are, finally ready to say goodbye to, and thank you to Reverend Tom. This reluctance to say goodbye pushed forward against my will by time. The seasons of our life needing us to say goodbye, to welcome something new. Today, I've adapted a writing by Karen Anderson called Reluctant Goodbyes. I hate goodbyes. I hate everything about them. It bothers me that goodbye isn't really what I think we most often want to say. When those I love are leaving me or I leave them, goodbye isn't what I want to say. I want to tell them that their warm hand on my cheek, which caught my desperate tears, made me feel whole once again. I want to tell them what, that without their quick giggle and tender words, my life can feel lonely. But instead, I tell them, I love you, and give them a big hug and say goodbye. And they leave and I leave. I feel a little disconnected and sometimes a little lost. I didn't want to say goodbye. When time whispers, move on, here's the next step, say goodbye. And I watch as my son walks into his first day of kindergarten, confident, filled with anticipation. These are my people, my life, he is thinking. Bye, mom, he yells to me and signs love, and I sign back. Bye, I whisper, but goodbye isn't what I want to say. I want to tell him that he is remarkable, brave, that I need more time to adjust to his boyhood, his self-assurance, his friends. I need more time to let go of one more tiny sliver of him. But no, instead, I say goodbye. I feel jolted, awakened by time moving forward without me. I didn't want to say goodbye. When someone I love leaves, goodbye isn't what I want to say. I want to tell them the truth about us. I want to set it straight, get to what was real, that I'm grateful for their presence. I want to tell them that I forgive them for being human, hoping they did the same for me. But no, instead, we say goodbye, and I feel captured in a storm of emotions that swirl around me. I didn't want to say goodbye. And when life will turn to me again and says, say goodbye, goodbye isn't what I want to say. I'll say, I've said my goodbye my whole life. Let me say it right, right now. Just let me say it right. But life, our future, will be there ushering me to something new. It will be one of the many times where goodbye was what I needed to say. Two years ago, Reverend Tom preached a beautiful sermon 
one of his best, in my opinion, announcing his retirement to our congregation. Our high school seniors were bridging that day, and Tom preached about endings becoming new beginnings. He told us a story about his little granddaughter who was getting ready to go to kindergarten and how each kindergartener-to-be was given a sunflower seed to plant in a cup and take care of throughout the summer. The sunflower would grow taller and taller and then bloom. And then finally, the bloom would become heavy with seeds and begin to droop. When the sunflower drooped, the children would know it was time to go to school and begin their new adventure. Tom said that we too were beginning a new adventure. On that day, with that announcement, we planted a seed together which would ripen in two years' time on the day of Tom's retirement. And during these past two years, we've been intentional about preparing for that ripening. The celebration team has laid out a splendid goodbye send-off for Tom. The transition team has interviewed candidates for inter interim ministry and will announce the final selection very soon. Your board of trustees has worked hard to make sure that the institution of our church is handed off in good shape. And to say that the best part, our friend Vicki Chavez gaining her freedom, was a stroke of luck that came just in time for Tom's retirement, would be to forget the hard work and unrelenting advocacy of our sanctuary team and the sanctuary leaders themselves. So much work has gone into these past two years. We've nurtured our seedling and watched it grow. It has grown tall and blossomed into this beautiful moment when the full fruit bends and dips toward the ground. For you, Tom, this means it's time for your new adventure to begin. For our congregation, however, when these seeds hit the ground, it will be time to plant again. Our new interim minister will arrive on August 1st and help us nurture a new seedling for another two years. We are so fortunate to be planting in fertile ground, cared for by all the previous generations who have loved this church and by our minister, Reverend Tom Goldsmith, who himself has loved it for 34 years. Tom, thank you for everything you've given to this congregation and to our city. Thank you for your perseverance, your wisdom, your fierce heart for justice. May the deep peace which passes all understanding be with you today and in the many, many years to come. And may you, the members and friends of the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City, continue to nourish, nurture, and cherish this church and its mission as it grows into the future. Amen.
In the summer of 1987, I began my ministry in this church with a seven-year-old and four-year-old in tow. Today, my ministry draws to a close, feeling a bit like a wind-up toy whose moving parts just completed its cycle. Fortunately, most of the parts still somehow work, so I'm being rewound, but pointed towards a new direction through the door marked retirement. I assume this will be fun, and I am outfitted for silliness afforded to all grandfathers. My children are now all grown up, but have delivered unto Mary and to me five granddaughters between the ages of three and almost ten. So if I do the math, I quickly realize there was a lot of life lived during those 34 years I was privileged to serve as your minister. They began with Ronald Reagan as president and now conclude with Joe Biden. I feel like I am leaving you in better hands than when I first arrived. In the intervening 34 years, I could not imagine sharing my life with anyone but you. The configuration of members and friends in this church community who greeted me in the 80s was considerably different from this group, which waves goodbye today. And there were many iterations in between. But the essence of this church throughout the decades, its very character, its objectives, its sensibilities, have always provided a consistent source of inspiration and strength to all who came and darkened its doorsteps. Maybe, maybe it's the coffee we serve. I don't know, but it's, it's been tremendous consistency. There's always, there's always been a, a single purpose here that lifted the human spirit and embraced hope as a viable concept. Reflections by the poet David White apply, I think, to us. If it's nothing else, he says, if it's nothing else, life is a creative, intimate, and unpredictable conversation, spoken or unspoken, and our life and our work are both the result of this particular way we hold that passionate conversation. Well, you know, the reason I left the ministry in New England after 12 years there can best be summed up by my failing to get beyond superficial conversation. Unless the conversation provides some passion and levity, that's not a conversation worth having. I have always cherished our conversations. We touched on virtually everything contained in the drama of human existence. There was always a lot of energy surrounding everything we discussed. Our conversations are what drove us to action. Our actions gave meaning to our conversations. 
And it didn't take long for you to bring me into the conversation. Within my first three months here, the board filed a wrongful death suit against a Salt Lake City policeman for shooting the Hispanic husband of our custodian at that time. Wow. My initial impression was that this congregation means business. Wow. And we held a lot of press conferences and although the blue wall of seven police officers who witnessed the murder never cracked, people of color in the wider community here who suffered for years at the hands of this one officer thanked us profusely for calling him out and for our attempts to restore justice in this community. The policeman left for Phoenix the following year. Well, barely did I have time to catch my breath when the Social Justice Committee whisked me away to protest at the Nevada test site. Everyone from our group got arrested, except for Judy Lord and I. As we headed to Tonopah to rescue our motley crew, we pulled over to gaze at the night sky in the desert. And I knew immediately that my life had changed. You know, I never saw anything like it. It came as a gift from someplace deep. And then finally, with all our protesters squished into a couple of 15 passenger vans returning to Salt Lake City, the conversation was rich and vibrant and confirmed for me personally that I found my people. But you know, we, we actually got off to a rough start I'll never forget my first worship service on the Sunday following Labor Day. We had only one service at that time, at 10.30. And when I stepped onto the chancel at 10.30, the only other person in the entire chapel was the music director, David Van Alstyne. He sat on the red chair closest to the organ kind of sprawled with his legs extended and hands behind his head, he wore a knowing smile. Now, you need to understand that an empty chapel is every minister's worst nightmare. So I asked David Van Alstyne, where is everybody? He chuckled and told me they, they come in when they're finished with their coffee in Elliott Hall and figure out that, well, you know, well, it may be time that the service will, will soon be beginning. Well, I was wise enough to know that I didn't know a lot of things, but I did know how to tell time. I instructed David to start the prelude, and I stood in the pulpit waiting to deliver my opening words to an empty church. And ever so slowly, people started trickling in, throwing me a huh, confused and angry glance while still clutching their coffee cups as they wandered in to take their seats in the pews. Following the service, I overheard some irritated comments. Two of them I will never forget. The first one, someone needs to tell the new minister he's not in Boston anymore. And the second one was, he can't be a Unitarian. 
he is every bit as strict as an Episcopalian. I figured my ministry in Salt Lake would not have a long run. But we got used to each other's ways. You know, it only took about a month before we started settling in and beginning church on time. But there may still be some old timers around who have never forgiven me. So I'm going to warn the interim minister that there may be a few stragglers left over from the good old days. The fountain of inspiration, the inspiration that flows so freely in this church is rare. Trust me, I know. The heart of this congregation and its steadfast courage in pursuing justice are all of one piece. The same thread that ran through the protests at the Nevada test site continued throughout the many wars that we protested in the Middle East. The same thread of fierce commitment ran through fighting for LGBTQ rights, Main Street, a partnership with Edison School, the refugee resettlements, support for Tim to Christopher, and offering sanctuary. And the, these were just the headlines. You are a relentless bunch when your bones tell you what you need to fight for. And when your spirit needs refueling, you show up in this chapel, modeled after a quaint New England meeting house. You show up in small group ministries, in adult ed programs, and you fully support religious education from birth through high school. And you show up for jazz vespers and auctions and family fun nights. You show up because, because they offer another opportunity to get together and continue with that amazing conversation. It is our selfless staff who carry the load and grease the skids, so to speak, so that all of this can happen in real time and even happen in virtual time, as was demonstrated these past 14 months. My deepest gratitude extends to a creative team forced to work together but don't worry about them. They, they love each other dearly. It wasn't, wasn't that bad a price. This miracle on 1300 East could not happen without Monica Dobbins, David Owens, Amanda Esco, Tristan Moore, Margaret Bean, Stephanie Park, Lisa Landers, and Lane Owens. They bring unique gifts to our church experience, and we are ever so grateful. You know, one issue unavoidably raised by, by all ministers really comes in the form of a question, and it's this. Can I be a minister and continue to be a real person? Can I be a minister and continue to be a real person? An older colleague of mine, now deceased, Peter Rabel, issued the advice he received from his mother. She said, 
Ministers must try not to make a noise like a minister. Isn't that sage advice? Ministers must not try to make a noise like a minister. I take that to mean that as ministers struggle for authenticity, they must give up the bluster, the antics, the pulpit pounding, the theater, essentially give up the noise to be real. Authenticity is one not by drawing attention to oneself, but through a true engagement with the human condition. This congregation has always allowed me to be myself, despite some fumbling and uncertainty, or maybe because of it. You have taught me these past 34 years, you've taught me the meaning of holy. It has nothing to do with book knowledge acquired in seminary or one's oratory style. Your invitation to welcome me into the hard places of your lives where you feel perhaps terror, grief, pain, so vulnerable. When you welcome me into those places, this represents holy ground. I walk on holy ground. You bless me as a trusted friend whose shoulder doesn't mind getting stained with tears. You know, whenever I, I walk into prisons and hospices and ICUs and courtrooms and clinics and rehabs, I walk on holy ground. I reach into my deepest self and speak from the heart. I may hold the hand of a dying person or stand silently with a family who's grieving. But I listen intently when unwanted news is quietly spoken. And that's when I know that a sacred bond has been forever formed, never to be tested again. Thank you for being your amazing selves. Thank you for the trust and for the joy and, of course, the laughter. You always like to celebrate with gusto, and you took me along for the ride. Thank you for your dependability always following through on social justice issues. You know, this church has always represented the work of our ministry. Understand that. It's been our ministry. Here, in this magnificent community, ministry has always meant what we do together. And together, we have impacted the world. <laughs> oh, yes, we have. But ultimately, in assessing our work and achievements, it's not simply about what we have done, but who we have become while accomplishing the tasks. You have helped me to grow as a minister, but more importantly, you've helped me to grow as a person. Please be aware of your power as a loving congregation 
Remember that when succeeding ministers receive the privilege to serve you. The journey to transform the world remains long. Welcome your new minister as kindly as you have welcomed me. But please, please, don't be late for church. Amen. Becky, yes. how can you repay a guy like Tom for everything that he's done for us for the last 34 years? It's going to be so hard. He's been such a vital part of our lives and has meant so much to us. Right. Um, so is this a bad time to ask for a postponement? I mean, can't we just wait to a later date when we feel more ready to say goodbye? Galen, I don't think this can be postponed. Tom is retiring and... We're filming here, so I think there's no time like the present to show Tom what our beloved community is doing to honor him. Okay, I, I mean, I know you're right. And we have had a lot of help. Oh my goodness, we've had tons of help. Actually, hundreds of voices from coast to coast have played a part. Yeah, and it sure helped that we have a couple dozen passionate and amazing people who are really committed to Tom to join the TCC. The TCC? Hmm, sounds like a government agency, but far from it. It's the Tom Celebration Committee. The TCC has worked really hard, and we found, together we found a lot of ways to show Tom just how much we care. And Tom will soon learn how many people have reached out to show their gratitude and love. And we're going to start with people everybody knows and loves, the Eans, Colleen Bliss and Darlene Thain. asked you, the congregation, both members and friends, for letters, memories, tributes, and photos for Tom, you surprised us with your touching, funny, insightful, and heartfelt responses. We think that Tom will be surprised too. Contributions flowed in from those close to home, but also from all over the country, from people who feel such an immense appreciation 
for the invaluable contributions he has made to their lives. Tom has seen some 20 published tributes representing close to 50 people, but another 100 or more are included that he has not seen, and we printed them out and compiled them into this binder for Tom's reading pleasure. In the second binder, we carefully and painfully transcribed Tom's handwriting as best we could and created a list of the 1,075 weddings he performed and 158 funerals he has presided over in the last 34 years. Also included are the signatures of all who have signed the membership book since 1987, better known as The Book. Then we added news articles and all the secret correspondence we've had with the congregation to plan the celebrations and surprises that we are sharing with you, Tom. This is for you, Tom. With much love from your followers, your friends, admirers, and accomplices, they represent the many people whose lives you have touched for the better. Can you feel the love already? And here's a tribute that won't fit into those binders. I am here representing the entire congregation with a gift that we hope you will find meaningful. Two of the most talented and generous ladies I know, Jan Crane and Christine Ashworth, have used those amazing talents to design and create a masterpiece of love just for you. It is a quilt depicting the chalice and the lovely words you have recited as you lit that chalice for 34 years, as well as a visual representation of each of the eight Unitarian principles with such gorgeous detail as could ever be imagined. Through this work of art quilt, we honor your time and talents that you have used to bless our lives, Tom. One of my very first memories of First Church is of Reverend Tom. It was at a dinner and Elliot Hall was packed with tables and people enjoying the night. I had attended worship before, so I was familiar with his face. I saw him in this crowd laughing with a small child next to him. This is an image I would see repeated time and again over the past 18 years. Tom with a child, making a joke, asking them questions, enjoying their company. There has been no greater supporter of religious education than you, Tom. You literally shepherded the building of the religious education building where I am sitting right now. You have welcomed our children with roses and thorns for each child dedication. You have shaken the hand and given a hug to our bridging youth. You have helped shape the vision for events and programs, held our families through loss and hardships. You listen intently as small ones say your chalice lighting words from the pulpit helping them light the flame. Our gift to you to celebrate and honor your time with us has been in the making for a few years. We've been slowly working on it, waiting for the day when we could give it to you. Envisioned by your friend Julie Miller with the help of Sue Cowley, we have a tree drawn by our children and youth. You'll see the leaves are fingerprints of our congregation, a little piece of each of us as you enter retirement. Thank you for your support and more than anything, your endless love for the children, youth, and families of First Unitarian Church. We will miss you and wish you all the best as you enter retirement. Hi, I'm Rebecca Heal, and I've been a member of the First Unitarian Church for a very long time, and I now have the privilege and the honor of chairing the Tom Goldsmith Refugee Scholarship Fund Committee. You know, I've been thinking about Reverend Tom's recent sermon about God, asking how we can stop arguing about God and instead talk about meaning and, and purpose and justice, and what each of us can do to provide a better tomorrow 
and many tomorrows and tomorrows. But right now you're probably thinking about yesterdays and yesterdays. All those Sundays when Reverend Tom inspired us and provoked us with his ideas and his passionate commitment to social justice. How he never backed down from an issue. How he has been a beacon of how to act with justice in this world. So what can we ever do to thank him except by putting his ideas into action? So I want to tell you about an ongoing fund that's been established in his honor. It's the Tom Goldsmith Refugee Scholarship Fund, and to thank the many of you who have already given so generously. Our longtime partner, the IRC, will guide, advise, and mentor the scholarship recipients. The fund will be administered by the Salt Lake Community College and will cover tuition, tutoring, books, bus fare, childcare, all the necessary, but up until now, unfunded expenses that have often made the difference in a refugee's success. As Tom would say, stuff happens. And when it does, the Tom Fund would be there. You know, as he recently said in that sermon about God, let's think about our role in the interdependent cosmic web. Let's think about it, and then let's act on it. Hello, I'm Natalie Aldiri, the Executive Director for the International Rescue Committee in Salt Lake City. On behalf of the International Rescue Committee, we are pleased to be part of the Tom Goldsmith Refugee Scholarship Fund. The Tom Goldsmith Re Refugee Scholarship Fund will provide critical support to aspiring students as they learn the skills they need to be successful in their educational pursuits. As a long-standing partner with the First Unitarian Church, we are honored to be part of this and to assist the students who will benefit from the scholarship fund through our College and Career Readiness Program and other mentorship opportunities we offer here at the IRC in Salt Lake City. We know that this will have a long-lasting impact on the lives of so many in our community. Hi, my name is Laura Thomas and I manage the scholarship program at Salt Lake Community College Foundation. The foundation currently has 145 privately funded scholarships, and the Tom Goldsmith Refugee Scholarship will be the first of its kind dedicated to refugee students. Salt Lake Community College currently has approximately 140 students who identify as refugees, and we suspect that number is much higher. These students face an uphill battle when it comes to education, and a scholarship for them, for students with their unique background, will mean so much to them. Your support of the Tom Goldsmith Refugee Scholarship will help our students who identify as refugees enroll in more classes, work less, be able to participate in extracurricular activities, and most importantly, be able to focus on their education. Thank you in advance for supporting this meaningful scholarship and for believing in our students. Your support means so much to us. We are just extending a hand through your kindness, and I am forever grateful to you for your help, your generosity, your kindness. Thank you. Well, just a few words of enthusiastic support for uh, the proposal to name the Reverend Thomas R. Goldsmith Minister Emeritus upon his, uh, his upcoming retirement. Now, I confess to a goodly amount of bias in favor of this proposal. Uh, for starters, my last official act as board president in early 1987 was to sign Tom's first letter of contract to become this church's next minister. But it was about that same time <clears throat> that our congregation voted to bestow on Richard Henry the title of Minister Emeritus. And that was well deserved. But Dick Henry had only occupied our pulpit for around nine years, and Tom Goldsmith uh, succeeded him for the next 34. By far the longest tenure of anyone who has led First Unitarian in its long 130 year history. My fellow Unitarian Universalists, I ask simply isn't this a no brainer?
When the celebration committee met for its very first meeting, we all just knew that there had to be a space named in or around this beautiful church for our longest serving minister. In his 34 years with us, Tom Goldsmith has left an imprint not only on the hearts of the many, many people who have called this our spiritual home, but also on the physical space, the building and surrounding grounds. So we had some ideas of some areas that might be named for Reverend Goldsmith, but then we turned to some of our other members and friends to also get their thoughts. And they had other spaces to add that were of significance to them. And so with a short list, the process began. Could it be the sanctuary where Tom's elegant and compelling sermons have rolled across the pews for 34 years of Sundays? Would we have a Goldsmith Hall leading to Elliot Hall? Or Elliot Hall leading to Goldsmith Hall? The space where we gather each week to begin our search for the answers to the critical questions raised in Reverend Goldsmith's sermons. Should it be the Religious Education Building, designed, funded by the congregation, and built under Tom's leadership, where generations of our children learn and practice all they need to know to carry our Unitarian principles and traditions forward? And then more and more people talked about the significance of the church plaza as, in their words, the space between the church and the community that Tom occupied so well. A symbol of the outstanding contributions to social justice in our community under Tom's leadership. A favorite part of the church built during Tom's time with us. The plaza is an open space that looks out over the wider community that is so critical to Tom's ministry, his concerns, and his outreach. It is a place of coming together, of entering our worship space, of activities fairs, and arts festivals, and wedding celebrations. A place of peaceful protest, and of wrangling children for in-gatherings. So we are announcing by an overwhelming vote of the congregation, the naming of Tom Goldsmith Plaza. We acknowledge that this space was funded by the generous contribution of one of Tom's greatest admirers, Barbara Tanner. This action is made official by a proclamation that acknowledges Tom's tenure and some of his many contributions to First Church. Someday, hopefully sooner than later, we First Unitarians will gather again in person, face to face, in joy and celebration on Tom Goldsmith Plaza.
The life of our religious community is fluid, ever-changing, with new lives, new visions, and new possibilities. 34 years ago, this congregation welcomed you, Reverend Tom, as its minister. We are so grateful that you came to practice your ministry among us. There we go. <laughs> we laughed, we cried, and we grew as you blessed us. As you blessed us with your gift for preaching. And even though you will no longer be with us, we will cherish the many memories we have shared. We will all miss you, and we are excited for the new adventure that you are beginning. In order to facilitate a gentle and harmonious transition to a new beginning, let us now formally release Reverend Tom Goldsmith from his covenant with us. Do you, the members and friends of the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City, now release the Reverend Tom Goldsmith from his role as minister of this congregation. You may say, I do. Reverend Tom, do you release First Unitarian Church from turning to you for ministry and guidance? I do. You are hereby released from your ministry at First Unitarian. <laughs> the congregation has presented you with these gifts in gratitude for all that you have given us and as a blessing of hope for the future. Let the circle of our love and the spirit of our community surround you always. Will everyone please join us in a blessing? May you find joy and happiness in the wondrous possibilities before you. May you be nourished and sustained by the love and gratitude of all who have known you and will come to know you. May you find peace and kindness in every day. Thank you so very much. I'll always remember this Sunday, the remainder of my days. There are a lot of Sundays I try to forget, but not this one. You're really, really uniquely wonderful, and I thank you. I've been asked to deliver the benediction. I'm happy to do so, and it may Trigger some memories and touch a nerve for some of you, although it's meant as widespread as possible. Let us advance with keen minds and sensitive hearts. Let us go forth with hope and strength. May we proclaim the power of life's meaning with deeds of justice, with bonds of friendship, and with words of true praise for the wonders that there are. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>